Hello, my name is David Lynch. I'm a neurology specialist registrar at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery at Queen's Square, uh, as well as at the UCL Institute of Neurology. And I'm part of the Queen's Square Adult Leukodystrophy Group. And I'm going to talk to you today about leukodystrophy in adults, which is an area that sometimes we don't talk about very much because leukodystrophy is so much more common in children. So what is leukodystrophy? Well, it really refers to a very large group of disorders where the main problem lies in the brain's white matter. Leuco means white and dystrophy means imperfect growth or a fault somewhere. And so leukodystrophy means any problem of the white matter that is genetic. In this diagram, you can see um, the way the brain is divided into the gray matter and the white matter, which is more centrally. In the brain, we have neurons and the neurons have a cell body. And then the neurons communicate with each other by sending messages down the axons to touch off other neurons and activate them. And this, uh, these axons uh, constitute the white matter. They're white because the axons are covered in insulation, which is myelin. And myelin is a sort of fatty substance which has a white appearance, and that's why it's white matter. So the white matter refers to all of the axons of the neurons, um, which is how the neurons in the brain communicate with each other. So when myelin doesn't form properly, or when myelin is damaged, it stops messages traveling effectively between the neurons. So here we can see a message coming from one nerve cell to another, but where the myelin is damaged, the impulse just sort of dies away. It doesn't continue, so the, the message isn't sent effectively. So if you don't have effective communications between neurons, then that's going to affect movement, speech, balance, uh, thinking, and memory. So what causes leukodystrophies? Well, some leukodystrophies um, occur because the myelin, fats, and proteins don't form properly. In some leukodystrophies, there's problems with enzymes that break down toxic substances. So those substances accumulate and they can be toxic to myelin and cause the myelin to break down. And sometimes the leukodystrophies occur because there's problems inside the cells in transporting chemicals from one place to another where they're needed for that cell to function properly. There are very many causes of leukodystrophies. Um, genetically, there are probably at least a hundred different forms of leukodystrophy and many that are uh, not, uh, not discovered yet even. Leukodystrophies can develop in childhood right the way up to adulthood, but most do start in childhood. Um, the number or the percentage of leukodystrophies that develop in childhood is a little bit uncertain, but I would say it's somewhere around 90%. So it's only a minority of patients with leukodystrophy first develop symptoms as an adult. Usually um, the forms that develop in children are ones where the myelin doesn't form properly or toxins accumulate. But as I say, you can develop leukodystrophy at any age and we have patients in their 60s or 70s who first develop symptoms of leukodystrophy. What sort of links leukodystrophies together is this appearance on the MRI scan. So on the left of the image, this is a, a slice through the brain on an MRI scan where the white matter appears to be normal. And on the right, we see this slice to a brain of a patient where the white matter here has very high signal on this MRI image, and that's abnormal. And this is a leukodystrophy. So what conditions can present in adults with leukodystrophy? Well, some are just the same conditions that can develop in children. So adrenal leukodystrophy can present in children or in adults. Metachromatic leukodystrophy can present in children and adults. So for some of the patients, we're seeing conditions that also are seen in, ch in childhood. But there are some conditions that really only present in adults and that children aren't affected by. And they can be quite different. And I'm going to talk about one of these today, which is CSF1R, but there are other conditions that only present generally in adults. As you would expect, Adults and children with leukodystrophy will present differently. They'll have different symptoms. And that's because in children, the difficulty occurs when the brain is in the developing state. 
But in adults, the brain is fully developed when symptoms begin. So the symptoms you would expect to be a bit different. In children, we see delayed milestones, delay in walking and talking. We see feeding issues, seizures, because the bones and joints are developing and the muscles are developing, sometimes joint problems and behavioral difficulties. In adults, we tend to see psychiatric changes. So depression and anxiety being very frequent, early symptoms of leukodystrophy in adults, as well as very prominent or obvious cognitive, so thinking and memory problems. We also see balance problems, so ataxia. We see stiffness in the limbs, which we call spasticity. And we can see problems with movement, like slowness of movement, or conditions that can look a bit like Parkinson's disease, and we call that Parkinsonism. We can see bowel and bladder symptoms quite frequently as well. So one of the leukodystrophies to mention um, that occurs mostly in adults, and I know that there are some um, adults supported by Alex TLC with this condition, is HDLS. And this has a couple of different names. I prefer HDLS. It stands for hereditary diffuse leukoencephalopathy with spheroids. It's one of the more common forms of leukodystrophy in adults, although that being said, it is extremely rare. It accounts for about 10% of adults with leukodystrophy and it's autosomal dominant in its inheritance. And what that means is that the child of a patient with HDLS has a 50% chance of developing HDLS themselves. Most leukodystrophies are autosomal recessive, but this is one which is autosomal dominant, and that's important for genetic counseling for these patients. HDLS is caused by mutations in a gene called CSF1R. So sometimes we might interchangeably use the term HDLS or CSF1R leukodystrophy. We can mean the same thing. HDLS has this really wide um, age of onset, which can be as low as 18, but can be up into the 70s. There have been people in their late 70s reported to first develop symptoms of HDLS. The symptoms are very variable in HDLS, and even in the same family. Sometimes you can have one patient who develops symptoms at a young age and another patient develops symptoms at a very old age. Some patients have no symptoms, they're completely asymptomatic, whereas some, their sibling might be very severely affected. So it can be very hard to predict on a patient by patient level, what symptoms someone might have if they have HDLS. The most common symptoms would be psychiatric changes, memory and thinking difficulties, stiffness in the limbs, that's spasticity, balance problems. Parkinsonism is quite common as well, which is a sort of slowness, difficulty with movement. And some of the patients may look like they have Parkinson's disease. Bladder urgency can be quite common. This is what the scan of a patient with HDLS looks like. So we can see this um, high signal here, this very white areas in the deep white matter, as well as these changes on the lower panels, which are like these bright dots. And this is called diffusion imaging. And early on, before this condition was very well recognized, um, these little dots were thought to be strokes. And some of these patients were misdiagnosed as having um, sort of stroke-like events. But we know now that these dots uh, in the deep white matter are quite common in HDLS. HDLS, as I said, is caused by mutations in a gene called CSF1R, and that can help us to explain what the basis of the disease is. So CSF1R is a, a receptor, you can think of it like a traffic light, that lies on the surface of the cells, which are in the brain called microglia. And in the brain, we have neurons, we have oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and microglia, which are various types of cells that come together to create a healthy brain. Microglia are involved in digesting waste materials. So sometimes they deal with infections and they're involved in maintaining brain health by doing this. So if CSF1R is not working properly, then this traffic light on the microglial cell isn't working properly and the microglia are defective. And that's thought to be the basis of HDLS. So the treatment is a multidisciplinary approach. 
like in any form of leukodystrophy. Physiotherapy is very important for stiffness and for balance exercises. Occupational and speech therapy without saying, of course. We use antispasmodic agents for stiffness. We use um, anticholinergics, which are drugs that help to treat bladder urgency or overactive bladder. And then there's been a suggestion that hematopoietic stem cell transplant can be a treatment to stabilize HDLS. So there have been maybe two or three reports only, no trial of stem cell transplant in HDLS. This is a form of bone marrow transplant from usually someone who is related to the patient who doesn't carry a mutation in the CSF1R gene. There have been two reasonable reports that we've read where HSCT has been found to stabilize two patients with uh, HDLS. However, we have to be very cautious about this because there haven't been any trials used. And as we know, there's a lot of variability in how HDLS can present. So although these patients may have stabilized with the stem cell transplant, they may have um, not had progressive symptoms without the stem cell transplant either. So there's a lot of uncertainty about this and HSCT is quite a a major treatment decision to make. So I think we're still in the early stages of knowing if this works. This is a diagram from um, one of the studies, which was, uh, came out of France. And it does seem to show that some of these changes in the diffusion abnormalities, these little dots that we see, actually improved over time after the stem cell transplant. We can see this one here seemed to disappear. So that was quite encouraging. Um, MRI changes after the stem cell transplant, but it's still very early days. And as I said, it's a major treatment option. So um, we need to do some trials really to know if HSCT is going to be a worthwhile treatment for HDLS. RS2 related leukodystrophy is another more common form in adults, but again, still very rare. This form is autosomal recessive, which means that you need to have both copies of the gene to be faulty to show symptoms. Uh, and the defective gene is RS2. But RS2, although it's recessive, can look exactly like HDLS. And we identified a number of patients a few years ago who looked like they had HDLS and were thought to have um, CSF and R mutations, but in fact it didn't. And the cause of their leukodystrophy was RS2. The only real difference clinically with RS2 to HDLS is that ovarian failure can occur in women. And but this is sometimes overlooked by neurologists because we don't tend to ask about ovarian failure or problems with fertility. RS2 is an enzyme that's involved in the translation of proteins. We know that we have DNA, which leads to the formation of RNA, which leads to proteins. And if protein translation isn't working properly, then this can cause um, significant issues with how the cells work. RS2 is particularly important at the level of the mitochondria, which is where cells generate energy. There are some similarities in terms of translation of proteins with RS2 and another condition called vanishing white matter. And indeed, they do have some similar MRI appearances at times. As I mentioned, CSF1R or HDLS can look very, very much like RS2. And this just shows a side-by-side -side comparison of the MRI scans. And I think most people, uh, most radiologists, experts at imaging would think these look very, very similar with these, these lines of dots deep in the white matter of the CSF1R patient, very similar to the RS2 patients. And this is quite a specific sign. We don't see this in other conditions. We call these deep white matter diffusion dots. We don't know what they mean, but they are helpful in making a diagnosis. So the treatment of RS2, well, it's very much similar to HDLS. So therapy input is very important. Antispasmodics, treatment of overactive bladder. There haven't been any reports of trying HSCT, that's stem cell transplant. And that's really because there's no clear rationale as to why HSCT would work in RS2 as opposed to in HDLS. In HDLS, the stem cell transplant is replacing the precursors of microglia, which are defective. But microglia are not defective in RS2, and it's unclear why HSCT would work, so it hasn't been attempted. Gene therapy, though, may be possible in future as, a, as an avenue to be explored. 
So the Queen Scar Adult Leukodystrophy Group. Well, why were we formed? Well, we were formed because leukodystrophy is extremely rare in adults and it's therefore quite a neglected area. It can take patients many years to have a diagnosis made and many patients we see have undergone many what we would consider unnecessary tests, some of which are very invasive like brain biopsies or nerve or muscle biopsies. So we were formed as a multidisciplinary group of neurologists, radiologists, metabolic diseases and genetics to take referrals from across the UK as well as internationally to review scans and histories and also to see patients and to try and advise the teams looking after these patients how best to take things forward with testing, what tests are useful, what tests might not be useful and then if we can suggest some specific diagnosis that might be um, applied and specific treatments where available and sometimes we also get involved in giving advice on genetic counselling. We've done this now for about seven years and we've managed to sort of put together uh, our own version of how we investigate patients with uh, adult onset leukodystrophies, which has been adopted by some other groups now as well. And we're also hopefully going to be part of the new National Inherited White Matter Disease Service as well. So we at Queen Square have been involved in developing the adult aspects of the service and in particular helping to tailor the new registry to adult patients and their families because as we, as we said some of the challenges adults face are different to, to children and there are different implications for families and for genetic counselling in adults. So we're putting our expertise into the new national IWMD service to hopefully make it um, as relevant to adults as it will be for children and hopefully that's launching next year. So I'd obviously like to acknowledge everyone I work with at the Adult Leak Dystrophy Group. We're a truly big multidisciplinary team. We are really grateful for the expertise that we get from every, every member of the team and that includes Professor Chataway, who is the, the head of the group and who is an expert on uh, inflammatory disorders. Uh, Elaine Murphy, uh, who is our metabolic disease physician. Henry Holden from Genetics and our two radiologists are Indran uh, Devagnanam and Dr. Matt Adams. And we're happy to be contacted for advice. We're happy to be contacted for referrals from other neurologists and hopefully we'll be part of the new IWMD service. Um, it was really nice getting the opportunity to speak to everyone today and I hopefully we'll see you later for the panel um, for any questions. Thank you.